AI when it comes to um, robots at at restaurants. Uh, I right. have a client that actually has a robot burger business, and I didn't even believe in it four years ago. But now I'm thinking this is going to be a common thing down the road. I'm going to go to a robot burger place. So, yes, I believe AI is going to threaten a lot of people. The caveat here, the bonus though for entrepreneurs. Welcome to another episode of Million Dollar Stories where we get to interview authors from all over the world. Today I got a guy, his name is Matt Rouse and uh, he's got a, a book that um, I think I'm really going to like talking about because I agree with this uh, this approach with AI. Um, the, the title of the book is called Will AI Take My Job? Predictions about AI in corporations, small business, and let's see, small business and the workplace. So, Matt, thanks so much for being here. Um, first off, I love the title of the book and I love the content. So uh, what made you write this book? Mike, thanks for having me on the show. I wrote this book because we use AI in my agency. We run two marketing agencies, one in the US and one in Canada. And we slowly over time had started to realize that we keep every time that we need something done, we go to software instead of hiring as our first choice, uh, yeah, which like right, mostly is it's not because we started to realize that we have less, we're less reliant on, on human staff, right. In our industry. And it's not the same in every industry. So I wanted to look into all the other industries and say, where are the differences? Where is AI going to affect jobs? Is it going to affect jobs and productivity uh, evenly across industries? And the answer is absolutely not. And what time frame is it going to take to affect jobs in those industries? So I cover a little over 20 different industries in the book. Got it. Now, the question is, will AI take my job? And when I first read that, I said, yeah, probably. Right. That's the way I looked at it. Um, simply because I'm able to duplicate myself. If I have enough digital assets out there, I could pretty much match my tonality um, and my voice. We have audiobooks that are being created through AI right now that do it at a much um, higher quality, but in a much shorter time frame. So AI, when it comes to um, robots at at restaurants, uh, I right. have a client that actually has a robot burger business. And I didn't even believe in it four years ago, but now I'm thinking this is going to be a common thing down the road. I'm going to go to a robot burger place. So, yes, I believe AI is going to threaten a lot of people. The caveat here, the bonus, though, for entrepreneurs, it's like a chainsaw. Just because there's a chainsaw doesn't mean that people's jobs will get cut out. It just means you need to play the game a different way. So is that your philosophy, too? Yeah. So, I mean, the idea that that as soon as somebody invents the chainsaw, there's no loggers anymore is completely not the way the world works. Bingo. Right. Uh, but as soon as we invent the machine that can autonomously know where it is through the forest, determine whether it should or should not cut down a tree, cut down the tree, put it on the, you know, put it on the skid, take it out to the truck and the truck autonomously drives itself back to the factory, which automatically processes the wood. That's a different story, right? We're about five and years that's from not, that. That's, yeah, well, I would say we're more like 20 years from that. Yeah. But being 20 years from that, if you imagine just 20 years ago, which at, you know, at my age is not that long ago, right? Because you always, the, the older you get, longer periods of time seem closer. But so 20 years ago for me was the early 2000s. I had moved to the United States. You know, I was working for Intel and, and Nike kind of back and forth as a contractor and, uh, you know, working in IT departments and marketing departments and cell phones were kind of just starting to get around to everybody having one, you know, and like Google ads hadn't been invented yet, you know, things like that. Right. And, but you look, uh, you know, 20 years out with a technology is almost impossible mm -hmm. because no one in their right minds when they're paying companies were paying a million dollars to be on the homepage of Yahoo, Amazing. you know, and 20 years ago, people, you know, in movies and stuff, they would be like, oh, imagine if you put all your money into Yahoo stock, you know, like, would you do that now? Absolutely not. Right. Because you don't know what's going to happen. Right. So yes, go yeah. ahead. 
All right. So, so I'm just saying that, yeah, technology is changing the world, but I think it's the Jim Rohn approach, which it's don't wish the world to be different, wish that you were better. And I just think that with all the tools and resources that are out there, you can't, you can't close your eyes and hope it goes away or hope it doesn't affect you. You need well, you to can. become more. It, well, you can. <laughs> you're just going to be hurting in a few months or years. You better so, be hoping for a universal basic income if you do that. <laughs> right. So, which I'm totally against. I think that this is great because it could say to you, all right, well, maybe I have to learn new skills, but maybe this will free up my time. I can have automation working for me, not against me. And therefore, it's serving me and serving my audience, my clients. So I look at this as, yes, there are definitely downsides, right? Unless you develop a new new pattern of living. Um, so what, do you, overall, do you believe AI is a healthy thing or a negative thing for society? That's a really tough choice to make because it really kind of depends on how it gets used. There are many, many, many positive things that are going to come out of AI. And there's some very severe negative things that are going to come out of it as well. Let's let's talk and, about the negative stuff real quick. What what are the top well, two? Well, it depends three? on how far out you want to go and how negative you want to talk. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, I'm example, a big Terminator right? 2 fan. All right. And all right, I think well, that's let me where tell it's going. you the let me tell you the Terminator scenario, right? The one that everybody's afraid of is a bunch of crap. And everybody's been using this example since the 70s. It was actually invented. It was called the paperclip experiment. And the idea is you get an artificial intelligence and you say, I want you to make as many paperclips as possible because you run a paperclip company. And eventually it will find ways to use up all the resources on the entire planet and turn them into paperclips killing every person, every animal, every tree, whatever, as long as it makes paper clips, because that's its goal. I believe if you create an artificial general intelligence, this is more than AI, this would be an AGI, that is a super intelligence, that it's smart enough not to convert humans into paper clips. So that's the argument that everybody has of, if we don't get it aligned with our values, it's gonna you know, kill everybody in for whatever reason. <laughs> But there is a, a very small percentage of people in the world who have an immense amount of money and power, and that is, is not arguable, right? It's an right. absolutely true thing. But they are, you know, for the most part, they rely on the population to generate their income, right? Even if it's a tiny, tiny fraction of income they make from each person. And if they even if let's say they make all of their money on stocks and, and you know, capital gains. Those capital gains from come from stocks. Those stocks are in companies. And if that company is, for example, if it's Intel, then Intel has to be selling processors to people to make money. Which makes them their money. But if nobody has a job anymore there's nobody to buy the processors then you know there's there's no income coming up the chain so that's one problem but the other problem that's kind of the same idea is if i don't need people to do labor anymore then what do i need the people for yeah there so you go why that's... would i bother taking care of people or why the you know if if you look at a totalitarian government who already treats its people really badly if they don't need those people to be laborers anymore, there's no point in having the people because it's just harder to control them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's a ter terrifying scenario, right? Where if you have an autonomous workforce and an autonomous military, you know, that's, that's controlled by AI systems and, and hypothetically by that government, they don't need people to fight in the wars. Right. They don't need people to go out and make crops because the AI does it. Well, I think the scariest scenario is the mark of the beast. Um, I think that the moment that computer and human get intertwined, which I think they're playing with right now pretty frequently, whether it's going to be how you pay for everything, where it's digitally inserted into your hand or into your neck or whatnot, that outlines everything in your bloodstream, how your body's responding, all that. 
is the moment where humans and computers are basically becoming like robots where they are being monitored and tracked by something or someone constantly. Now that's happening through your phone, yeah. but the moment it's in your body, now it becomes, there's no way to detach. And that could mean, all right, you don't play by our rules. This is going to be a signal given to you and you become sick or you do what I tell you, or you're going to feel a certain way, or you're going somewhere where I don't want you to go. You can't go there now. We're going to, we're going to stop that. So I look at that as the scariest um, outcome, which is pretty soon, in my opinion, 15, 20 years out. Do you agree I mean, with if that? You're, if you're looking at something like Neuralink, right, where right. It's, it's feeding back into the system and you can take commands in both directions, that's one thing. Getting people to accept the fact that they want to put it in their body is another thing. I mean, it's definitely not going to happen anytime soon. Some people you think will, so, right? You just saw COVID, man. People were putting shots in their body within a week of it being de developed. You don't think that people yeah, are willing to do this? Yeah, but that's not like wires coming out of your brain kind of thing, you know? Like, it's going to take, it, there's there's a big leap there, right? And And the leap is too far. But now that doesn't mean that there is not a way for AI systems to be used in a in an invasive manner. Like, I'll give you an example. This is a functional example, something that works today. So what they did is they they put a camera in a room and then it's like an office. They put a camera in the office and then they gave it access to the Wi-Fi router to see the signal pattern of the Wi-Fi going out and back. And basically it recorded and, and the AI recorded all of the patterns of the people moving and what was on the Wi-Fi router as well as the camera. And then they took the camera away. And when people were walking around in the room, it was able to tell by the strength of the response in the Wi-Fi router of where the people were in the room in 3D. And that's, this was that's not Batman. That's uh, that's Dark Knight stuff right there. This is not a specialized router. This is an off-the-shelf, just regular old Wi-Fi router that you could buy at the store. So that's something that can already be done now. There was um. Like the facial recognition technology, it can already tell if you're wearing a hat or sunglasses or anything like that, who oh, you are yeah, still. I've seen that. A lot of them, the, some of the systems can actually tell people by the way that they walk and their mannerisms and stuff without seeing their face. So they can kind of estimate, they can say, this is approximately these people that we have the pattern of. And then with other data fed into the system, it can say, okay, that's that person. Um, it's like the idea of the the serial killer that they caught with the DNA, but they didn't have his DNA in the system to match it against. So they match it against the DNA of his relatives that had volunteered their DNA into the system. <laughs> and by basically they were able to take it find out who's a match of relatives of i think it came out to like 64,000 dna patterns and then by narrowing it down at who could possibly be in the places that he was in the right age groups and everything they were able to determine who he was <laughs> so there's ways to figure this kind of stuff out and ai is definitely going to help with that be used as countermeasures well okay so let's talk about the benefits that's a, that's a, there's right. a lot of negative there to unpack in my opinion, the benefits of AI are going to resemble Superman 2. Are you familiar with the movie at all? Well, it's been a while, but I, I definitely have seen it. Well, Clark Kent, Superman, goes mm -hmm. back to his, uh, his um, palace of um, isolation, right. his crystal palace. And he puts the, the, the crystal in and mm -hmm. he speaks to his dad. Now, his right. dad is just a computer program, right? Basically, right. it's just an automated message. And Lex Luthor goes, goes back and does the same thing. Mm -hmm. All it is is the perfect visual, audio, recording, everything of someone who lived maybe, let's just say, hundreds or thousands of years ago. Now, imagine having enough digital assets put out there on podcasts, videos, books, information that you create, any type of content that someone could pull up and say, you know what? Great granddad, Matt Rouse. What was he like? Oh, let me click a button. And then you talk to that child as if you're there. I think we're going to see that before our time is over. So that is. Yeah, I think that's benefit. coming. Um, 
essentially it's like a human emulator, right? Where it's it's not really you, but it sounds like you and it looks like you and it talks like you. Yeah. And that would be difficult for somebody who doesn't have access to the original to tell the difference, right? I think kind of a more something we're going to see sooner uh, that's already in development is something like this, right? Where you have this box and I'm here and I'm having a conversation with you, but it's not me, right? It's yes. the AI with my voice. The video has been programmed with my mannerisms and how I move my head and what I look like. And it has conversations on my behalf, right? Yes, that's happening with websites right now. Right. It's starting to happen. And I mean, the technology is not quite there. You can definitely tell if you're looking for it. Um, and especially with the voice stuff, it doesn't have the random inflection and stuff in it, but it's getting better. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at where the technology has gone, right? Look at 11 labs last year. I like 11 labs. Like, I, I look uh, at it. one year ago, though. You're yeah. Right. One year ago, you're like, this is a hundred percent. This is a computerized voice. You can tell they used to use them on like YouTube ads and crap all the time. Right. And now you hear an 11 labs voice and it's really close. Right. I duplicated my voice on 11 labs. It's almost impossible. My dad could not tell who was who. Now try it with play HT, which is another one that also has an API you can use just like 11 labs, but it seems to do better with voices with accents outside of like 11 labs is pretty specific on some of the accents it does like it does uk and australian and and a couple of us accents and it's pretty poor at canadian but you know uh play ht does a really good job with consistently producing accents and now look at you're talking about you trained your voice right yeah so that it would be able to speak in your voice that system i uploaded a 90 second clip of me speaking in every type of um, right tonality last year you had to put in a 90 minute clip <laughs> right ah uh, yeah Play ht can now do it in 30 seconds yes so in 30 seconds you can cl voice clone your voice that's insanity right that's already right and now yes so here's the thing about any kind of technology right that has even just a logarithmic scale right it gets better so much faster that it is incomprehensible by the average person, right? You cannot understand how that increase is because your brain is just not programmed for it, right? It would be like if you see like a lion on the horizon and it's running towards you and you could be like, it's going to take that lion like two hours to get here. But one hour, it makes it halfway and the second hour, it's next to you. And that's kind of a, a normal rate of speed, right? But if it was logarithmic, then by the time it got a quarter way here, then the next step, it would be standing next to you as if it disappeared and appeared next to you, right? Yeah. So it's just so much. You just went mute for a second there, sir. Oh, you just went oh, mute there. Sorry. Right? I... I got my book in my hand and it hit the space bar. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. So if, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Okay. So if you think about how difficult would it be to beat a computer at chess? Oh, it's yeah. It's basically impossible. Right. Right. At this point, the computer is the best at playing chess in the world. It can Correct. beat every grandmaster at chess in the world simultaneously with one system. As the AI can beat the Turing test, the next step is it understands that it has to dumb itself down to fool you that it's not a computer because it's so smart, right? So each step is unimaginably bigger once it gets to a human level, right? Mm -hmm. So right. as... An AI is not a well-rounded person, though. So if you look at something like GPT-4, it's at least 10 times more productive than 3.5. Yes. So if you're not using the paid version of GPT, you are using basically like AI light. But it's still good. It's still, it's still good. good. Yeah. But it's nothing compared to 4. Right? Right. And then if you add something like custom instructions 
where you can tell it, okay, this is the way that I want this model to perform for me. This is how I want it to function. Then the output that you get is even better. So even though, you know, myself and somebody else are both using GPT-4, when I've programmed mine with custom instructions, the output I'm going to get is better than the output someone else is going to get. So a custom instruction is something like, I want you to always work step by step mm -hmm. so that it will design, it'll make a plan before it executes the plan, which makes it more impactful. It's better at writing. It's better at figuring things out. And you could put that in your prompts, but if you put it in your custom instructions, it will always do it. And actually a good, uh, I have all my custom instructions are on LinkedIn. So if you go on LinkedIn, look through my posts. Yeah. I'll you can get all out. the, cons I use basically all 1500 characters of custom instructions. Are you building your, now that you're becoming very well versed in this world, are you starting to mm -hmm. notice that you're building your business around AI? hundred percent. Yes. Right. So you're not we're trying using to build it, our business around, around it. We're trying to build our business around where we think the next generation of AI is going to go. So the yes. only person that we have on staff right now is a proofreader. Amazing. Like a, essentially a book editor. She is one of my book editors. And so, that's because we need to check the output. So what I'm noticing, and maybe you're seeing the same thing, but I'm in, a, I'm in many groups that are entrepreneur based, right? Mm -hmm. And years ago, these groups probably were saying, I can't wait to build a company that has a thousand employees. Right. Well, now that's different. I want to build a small team that makes a major impact. And I'm going to use virtual assistants. I'm going to use AI and I'm going to use the programs that are at our disposal to build a small company that does major numbers. That's what I'm seeing. That's what I'm doing. Is that what you're noticing out there too? Yeah. Well, I mean, Sam Allman himself in an interview said that he thinks that 24 months from now, a, you know, the, the power of an AI at that point will have the same productive output as a small corporation. Holy smokes. So if you have one AI that can do the work of, you know, a hundred person or a hundred employee company, how many employees do you really need? Right. Wow. Now imagine for a moment, and this is not science fiction, right? An AI agent um, there's several of these out right now. Like Microsoft just came out with one a few weeks ago where uh, it's called Autogen and it's an agent team. And each one is a GPT that has been given a specific persona and they talk back and forth to produce the output. So one can be the product manager. One can be the product designer. One's the graphic designer. One is like, say you're going to make t-shirts, right? So, okay, so one's the shipping manager. One is the CEO. And then you say to the CEO, I want you to produce a million dollar uh, book podcast t-shirt. It's these are who it's for. These are the sizes that we want. Um, you know, get it done kind of thing. And it will go and go to the product designer and they'll throw the ideas back and forth and it'll all figure all that stuff out and try and produce that result for you. It's not great yet. Well, yeah. But, but still. just like anything, right? It's not great yet, but neither, you know, mid journey wasn't that great last year. Right. And now it's essentially photorealistic. Do you, is that the best one? Um, as a great tidbit for maybe the listeners out there, what is the best uh, text or prompt to picture AI that's out there? Is it, is it mid journey? In my opinion, mid journey is the best. Okay. Yeah. I'm playing with a few like right now. Yeah, I do like like okay. So if you need something that's not safe for work kind of thing, then you could use something else. You could run your own model. Um, you can also use some like stability. You know, if you need certain types of images, Dolly works really good for. I'm like, using Dolly. Yep, I'm using yeah. Dolly right now. Dolly three, right? Uh, if you, I think so. Yeah, the paid, whatever that is. is that what yeah. That is? So if you have GPT four, like the paid version, GPT four plus, then you use Dolly three. Yeah. But you can tell it to make the prompt to create the image, whereas mid-journey, you have to create it yourself. But if you want to hack for that, go to the page that tells you all the instructions of how to use mid-journey and just copy the URL and put it into GPT-4 
and say, based on this documentation, write me a prompt that will produce blah, 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 blah. Wow. And it'll write your mid journey prompt. And then you put it in a mid journey. Guys, anybody listening to this, that is a major nugget. I didn't know anything about that. So that's huge. So the GPT-4 context window is 100,000 tokens now. That's like 80,000 words. So you can put entire documents, entire books in some cases into it and ask questions about it. And basically I call it talking to your documents. So I'll take all the reports out of Shopify for a store and I'll put it into upload it into GPT-4. And then I'll say, I'm trying to figure out why sales have decreased, even though abandoned carts have not decreased. And it's going to say, okay, well, here's the statistics that we think have something to do with that. It looks like you have fewer people have initiated checkout. And then I can go look at the checkout page and say, oh, you know what? We added a coupon code box to this page. So people are going and searching for coupons and they're not checking out. So I take that off the page and then the sales go back up. And I say, thanks, GPT. <laughs> so you can put data in and analyze it and get useful information back yeah the other thing is i mean there's so many things like okay so in i didn't use ai to write my book but i used i don't know if you can see it very well on here but i used ai for the cover art yeah yeah and then i used canva to do the rest of the cover art amazing and then there's a three key takeaways at the end of each chapter and what i did Some, is was that like, summarized from Chat GPT four, yeah, we wrote the chapter and then we put it in a GPT four and we said make three key takeaways from this, and then we just edit it to make sure it's correct. Yeah, because I've noticed, and we are, we have a ghostwriting company. If you if you rely upon it too much, it's going to be very redundant. There's many mm -hmm. issues with it. The tonality's off, so it's good but not great. Maybe that will change in the future, but I think that um you still need that proofreader. You need still you, you need that human feel to it to boost some things that AI doesn't know about you. That's right. I think my picture just fell off the wall. Yeah, it did. It stayed on there. That's good. <laughs> it's um, hanging on by a thread. One thing that I want to talk about with you is and this is probably the other scary aspect in the very near future. Individuals going to school are not going to read a book. They're not going to do anything other than go to chat GPT and say, who was this person? What does this person stand for? What is this right. book about? I believe that's the scariest part because whoever's programming the AI will control the masses, right? They're going to control how they think, what information they see. So sort I, of, right. I mean, it's really hard to do that right now because the technology to steer the ai the way that you want is not really there yet well i now, you could guardrail it you could guardrail it and guardrailing it it's not the same thing well putting on guardrails says if you try to tell it how do i make this illicit substance that it will tell you i'm not allowed to make this thing or i can't show you how to make this thing but there is also microsoft had a paper come out a few weeks ago about how you could untrain something from a model but that has just barely been invented. So when the model that they used is they essentially took all things Harry Potter out of, you know, a GPT and it is still in there. And if you dug really hard, you could find it. But what they've done is they've said that none of this information has any value. So you won't want to share it with anybody basically is the, the simple version of how they did it. But you could have, if the output is of this type, rewrite it to be, you know, more left-leaning or more right-leaning or whatever it is that you're trying to do. I mean, it's possible, but it's just that the technology is not quite there yet. And there's nothing stopping you, like, short of, of some money. There's nothing unprotected open source model. Right. Yes. There, there is that for sure. I I've seen, this is not so much centralized as you think, but for the most part, let's just, let's put, kind of paint the picture. I'm thinking of a student in school mm -hmm. typing in who, who was Joe Biden or who was Donald Trump? Just let's, these are extreme measures. Sure. One will be painted very positively and one will be painted very negatively based off of a couple different factors. And I think it's whoever pulls the strings. Let's just say Microsoft has its own um, 
AI that somebody goes to for every question. Mm -hmm. It's going to be skewed, right? So I think that it's just the same aspect with books in school. I believe that the school system keeps people at a certain level mentally when it comes to the financial sector. Mm -hmm. They want to keep people controlled. And that's why they don't tell them to start businesses. That's why they don't tell them to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or Think and Grow Rich, or Outwitting right. the Devil. And that is just taken from this aspect of books and then making it digital form on your phone. So that is really scary because it's all about convenience. And humans are like water. They're going to go. But I mean, that's convenient. already done now, right? Like, essentially, Google is the internet at this point, right? Correct. And they can take something out of the index at any time and it doesn't exist anymore, you know, for most people. And like they, it didn't used to be called the dark web. That just came out when Google took over the internet. Before that, it was just called the internet, right? And you would yeah. like, there was some sites that are like, oh, you don't want to go there because it's got a, uh, you could go buy, you know, drugs off that site. So don't go to that one. You know, you used to have, IP blocking software or your service provider. Like I used to work for Shaw communications back in the day and we're an internet service provider. And if we got abuse complaints for malware, we would block the IP addresses of those websites to all the users. Right. And there's nothing saying that your provider can't do that. Now there's open internet law, but eh, you know, is anybody checking their router to see where it's going? You know, like, is anybody checking the block list? You know, no, they're not, right? So there's nothing stopping it right now. And not only that, like if you look at a Google search right now, if you search for, um, say, a specific type of product and you haven't made a buying decision yet, Part of the process is natural language processing. It converts it into, you know, what is the intent of what the person is doing? And it doesn't give you the absolute best result. It gives you the best result combined with what will make Google the most money. And that's the result set you get. Wow. Right? So you right. get ads yes. and you get, you know, this stuff. And, and then they're obscuring what was typed in to make the ads come up to the advertiser. So on my end, I can go in and they'll say, here's 80% of the things people typed in that you paid an ad to show on, but we're not going to show you the other 20%. Well, why? Right? Well, because if I know what people type in that then brings up an ad, which then makes them go purchase, I buy less ads. So if I'm going to buy more ads, you have to obscure the result. And then other things go on. Like we have, we have some companies that work in the legal industry, um, like fugitive recovery and bail and things like that. And one day Google said, we're not going to do bail ads anymore. Well, that was shit. That was 20% of our business, like gone because we manage the ads for these companies and they just decided they weren't going to do it anymore. Right. So I mean, if you think the internet's free and open now, well, unless you're using, you know, DuckDuckGo or ULA or something for your search and, and for your browser, like if you're using Chrome, forget it, right? Every website you go to that has a Google font or uh, a CAPTCHA, all that's tracking, right? Every site pretty much is running Google Analytics and Search Console, so they have all the tracking data. And then even if you're not using Google Search, or Microsoft search or their AI or anything, there's still a hundred other ways you're getting tracked, right? Very true. Facebook still has a profile on you, even if you're not on Facebook. And they build that out of, you know, it's like the idea of where they caught the serial killer with the DNA of the relatives, right? You don't have to be on Facebook for Facebook to be tracking you. Yeah. Very good point. So, so anyway, saying now right that now, we live in a dystopian world. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it's bad now, but imagine 30 years from now is, is what we're we're getting at is it's gonna get like we we're free now. It's only gonna become more and more restrictive, very yeah, much. Yeah, and I mean I, I put free in quotes a bit, you know, but I the the pendulum generally swings both directions, right? So if 
the world becomes more controlled because of AI, it's likely that AI will also open up opportunities Bingo. for people to escape that control. Bingo. Right? I agree. And, That's what I'm saying too. So yes, yeah. there are pros and cons to everything. And I think that there's there's a lot of positivity. So don't don't turn a blind eye to it, right? Use it to become more free, become more awake, become uh, more, I guess you just say wealthy in general. I think this is the, the land of opportunity for a reason. We can really take this new idea built by many people and just utilize it to the fullest. So this is great for entrepreneurs, yeah. but how about the people out there? Who, they're listening. Who's going to be most affected by this? Well, most affected it is kind of hard to determine. If you mean earliest to be affected. Let's say earliest. Then... Who's the, right around the corner, what would you say? If if your job fits into these three things, one of them is it's text based, it's digital, and everything that you do has been documented, then your job essentially can already be done by an AI. So a good example is uh, customer service text chat based support. Bingo. Right? Yes. So there's a company... Uh, I'm not going to name them, but uh, over six months ago now, they took a chat bot with an AI with 3.5 that they created, and they put it into 10% of their customer support requests going to that bot. They found that their wait time for people to get help went from five minutes to five seconds, and their customer satisfaction went up 40%. Oh, my God. So guess what they do now? Well, they've uh, 100%. rolled it out to 50% and still same thing, right? People like using the, the customer support bot better than the real people. So now they got rid of 90% of their workforce and the remaining 10% are the ones who can solve the difficult problems that the other customer support reps can't solve. They're the ones who the customers like the best, the ones who have the most knowledge of the company, the ones who are best at towing the company line or whatever those factors are that the company is looking for in KPIs, right? They're key performance indicators. Yep. They keep those 10% to answer the things that are the, you know, the outsider, the outliers that the AI doesn't know how to fix. And everybody else is talking to an AI and they don't know it. Yep. And I, I think that's that, already happened. Yeah. I, right. I, that's I, not like. Well, three years from now, no, this is like, it's already in place, right? Yeah. And there is a hundred companies out there already making AI based support software. So, text, so if you do digital, technical support, go find another procedures. job. Yes. Yeah. Like, okay. So imagine your company has been recording every single phone call when you call in to whatever it is, right? Let's say it's the bank. Every time you call into the bank, they're recording your call for, you know, yeah training purposes what do you think they're going to do with all those recordings of course right? they're going to run through ai quality assurance they called it before they will transcribe all of those put them into a lang chain data set or some kind of data set that the ai can use and now the ai knows how to solve every problem that anyone's ever called in about and then they pass that through to 11 labs or play ht or one of these voice generators and now you're talking to an AI over the phone and you have no idea. You just know, man, this person knows how to fix my problem right away. So. Well, I have not going to keep everybody. Well, right? I have a, I have a solution, right? I, I, I believe that the answer to every one of these problems is to learn the tool or learn how you can benefit from it, which means never rely upon one income stream and also become more entrepreneurial. That is my solution to pretty much everything. If you are less reliant on corporation or government, you are more free and you are therefore uh, happier as a result that you are in control of your destiny. So that's yeah. my solution. Is that the same solution you teach people? Hey, this is great. Use it, but become more entrepreneurial. Buy into assets, have assets pay you, create businesses, create revenue streams. Is that the answer? It's the answer for some people. Now, not everyone is an entrepreneur. I know lots of people who have no interest in starting a business whatsoever, right? Oh, I, I do too, yeah. And they just don't, right? And that's fine. But if that's the case, then you have basically three options. 
you try to be the absolute best in the eyes of what would make you keep your job. So what the company sees as being indispensable about you, that's what you need to be the best at. Because then when the AI comes for your job and they're going to use a chat bot or they're going to bring in a, a, you know, an HR bot or a finance bot or whatever it is, or a, you know, a software analyst bot that's going to do your job. They're not going to get rid of everyone because somebody's got to be there to fix the problems that it doesn't understand or the new things that it's never seen before. So you want to be that person. Okay. So number two is you try and find a similar, you know, something that you can use your skills towards that also has difficult to replicate tasks. So a good example would be if I'm a bank teller, I would be worried about my job in the future. So I would switch to an industry where people are not going to be comfortable talking to computers about for a really long time. So maybe that's finance, lending, mortgage, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Option number three is you just close your eyes and your ears and you say, la, 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 and you hope you have a job down the road. But I wouldn't recommend that strategy. You need to learn how to add value to your marketplace or to those around you. And I think the phrase that really you know, sparked in my brain while you were talking is that the stronger AI becomes, mediocrity in the marketplace will not be tolerated. Mediocrity no. on the phone, no. on the computer, in your workplace will not be tolerated. You're the first one gone. You're on the chopping block. So this is a good thing. Yeah, it's going to really thing. shift the balance of power between employees and companies. Um, and and I think it's going to go both ways, just like everything, you know, like the pendulum swing in both ways, right? So the the average employee is going to have less power in the future, but the top employee is going to have way more power in the future because right. they need somebody who is the top, top of the top, the best of the best to handle all the things that the AI can't handle. But if you only handle medium level or low level tasks, then an AI is going to be trained to do those things in the future. Who is right. the greatest competitor for open AI right now? Who's going to, who, who competes with chat GPT for? Um, I think Anthropic has definitely got the best opportunity because the CEO of Anthropic uh, basically helped build GPT-2 and 3. And also they have the, well, arguably the second largest AI data center once they get all their, you know, I think it's 24,000 A100s. It's an insane number. And, you know, it's hundreds of millions of dollars of hardware. And once they have that, they'll be able to train a bigger model than anyone else except for OpenAI. Hmm. So you got OpenAI, then you've got you know, Anthropic, and then probably, you know, something overseas will be next. Japan is working on a huge model. Um, same with Saudi Arabia has an open source model that's out. That's really good. Um, or actually it's, it's um, United Arab Emirates, I believe, who makes that model. Um, so there is some stuff overseas. They're not nearly as competitive as those top two. But then also I wouldn't put Llama out of the fight. That's Facebook's AI, which is also open source right now. Wow. But who I, knows I don't about know much future. about that one. Llama, the, the top Llama is about as good as GPT-3. Uh, but it's open source. And also if you understand Python and you're a developer, you could easily um, take the guardrails off it and use it kind of as is without any security on it. So you can get you know, relatively good answers. And the reason I, I wouldn't recommend you do that, but the reason is that when, when they put restrictions on the AI model, it makes the model less functional overall. So the GPT-4 
that OpenAI uses at their office and the OpenAI GPT-4 that we use are not the same thing. Their model is better than our model because the one we're using has more restrictions on it. And when it has restrictions on it, it affects things unrelated to the problem they're trying to protect from. So, you know, their model could be doing all kinds of things that we don't know about. Like they're coming out with every month, month and a half, they're coming out with all these, suddenly they're like, oh, well, now it can take pictures and and now now it can identify, you know, broken brake pads and, and you know, but last week it couldn't, you know, yeah, no. It, it didn't just suddenly be able to do that, right? They're just oh. allowing us to use that part of it because they've tested it for security and guard railed it and whatever. But the one they're using is definitely more powerful. Would you want to be born in right now and l wake up completely as a young uh, kid in a, an AI driven world? Um, I I'm born in 1984 and I say to myself almost on a daily basis, I am so glad that I woke up or I grew up without an iPad or a phone in my hand. And now that we have AI, which is going to completely shake up the world. I do not, I do not wish upon uh, anybody to wake up as a kid at six years you know, old and say, instead of riding a bicycle or go play around a dirt bike, that you go and pick up a phone. I, it's just, it's, my, my daughter's it's seven. Okay. And I mean, there's a little bit of tension in that world, but we also, you know, intentionally moved out into the country. And so, like, you could tell by my chicken shirt. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You got in the farm. Um, yeah. So we have like a hobby farm. We have, 60 chickens now i think and uh you know a cat and a dog and we got some gardens and my wife's a flower farmer now oh nice and uh so you can definitely find some balance right i mean you don't have to go open up a, a hobby farm somewhere like go off grid <laughs> or something but you know my daughter is really into minecraft right now um, she builds stuff she works on roblox games with me together so we build roblox games she understands some basics of programming, but also she talks to the AI almost every night before she goes to bed. She'll talk to Pi. We got Pi installed on my phone, which is a free AI, by the way. You should install that on your phone and mess with it if you can. I don't know what that is. And it's just, how do you spell it? Is it just Pi? Just P-I. Wow. Yep. Okay. So you install Pi and she's learning how to like how to talk to it to get the responses that she's trying to get. But then she's also always trying to like teach it how to have emotions, which is super cute. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I think, you know, in, and you're talking about 1984. I was born in 1972. I got my first computer when I was eight. And you could type in Commodore. Like I type, it was actually an Atari. And you could type in line by line, you would type like 10 for line 10 and do this thing and then you would use basic programming and then it would do stuff and i was like this is like a miracle like i've never seen anything like this in my entire life right and nobody else had either my parents are just dumbfounded i'm like well i made this game and you press n and it goes to a place and describes it and then there's a monster there and you press f to fight it you know and and i'm building this stuff and they're just and i had that same feeling when i first used gpt like chat GPT, I first used it and it did something. And, and I was like, holy shit. Like, oh, yeah. I have never seen anything like this in my life. And I work in computers, right? So and I've worked my whole life in technology. And I'm like, this is something different. Like, this is not anything like anything that's ever been made before. And now I use it every single day. I use it every day, almost all day. And not just that AI, I use generative AI all the time. I use AI systems for all kinds of stuff. Like, let's talk about your show for a second, okay? So I have my 16 by 9 video that I make, right, for my own, you know, mm -hmm. show, my own podcast. And uh, it's Digital Marketing Masters, by the way. I was going to ask you, but, my last question was uh, talking right? about your business, but... Uh, sure. But I well, I mean, so anyways, we record something, whether it's... It's for us or for a client. We record it in this kind of YouTube format. We edit it down to the video. Now I've got my video piece. Okay. I used to have virtual assistants who would go through and cut two or three clips out of that show. 
and then transcribe that to make a few posts, take a couple screenshots to put in, you know, the Facebook and the LinkedIn and the Instagram and whatever, right? And you want to make a couple vertical videos like Reels or TikToks or something. Do you go, okay, yeah, we're going to do that too, but this is going to take forever. It's going to cost me a fortune. Video.ai. Right. Well, now I take this video, I put it into Runway ML, and Runway will transcribe it with the time codes for YouTube. So it gives me a perfect transcription file, almost perfect. I run that through GPT-4 to check for errors. Usually it's people's spelling and people's names and stuff like that. I use GPT-4 to translate it into several languages. I upload all of those into YouTube. So now my show is on YouTube and it's transcribed into several languages. So it can be on Spanish YouTube and French YouTube and, you know, whatever. Right. And then I upload my video. I just take the URL. I put that into an app called Get Munch. Get Munch will then automatically in about an hour give me back anywhere from 12 to 20 vertical video clips and it's transcribed and it's captioned and it word for word, like karaoke style puts the highlight on the word as it's spoken automatically puts emphasis on certain words that it thinks are more important. And it gives me the hashtags and the description and the title. And it generates a tweet for me for every single one of those video clips. It does all that in an hour. And so I put that all out. I take my transcript. I stick it into GPT-4. I say, give me the three main points of this. It gives me those. I say, write a blog post about number one. Write a blog post about number two. Write a blog post about number three. And I give those to my editor. And then I say, I want a social media post for Facebook about number one. I want a LinkedIn post about number one. And it gives me those. And from that one video, right, I get over 50 pieces of content. And it takes two hours. That used to take us two weeks. Who's posting? Is it a manual posting then? Or are you, are you using like a I, HeroPost.io? No, so we use Zoho. So we use Zoho Social for our own stuff. Got but it. for clients, okay, we tend to post natively. Um, it depends what it is. You know, some things, I don't know, like sometimes the features will change on the apps. And if you're using, you know, something to post for you, you don't get to use all those features. So it yep. really depends what it is. Um, yeah. So like YouTube, I'm never using a scheduler on YouTube. I'm in YouTube studio, uploading it and then filling in the stuff I need to fill in. Um, just because I don't trust the schedulers. I've seen too many things screw up. Same with Facebook. Usually Facebook, Instagram will use Facebook's, um, you know, posting system in business manager. So you brought up Get Munch. Now that's a great tidbit for the listeners, but uh, yeah. I recommend, and this is something I've seen work. I don't think it does as much as yours, but a simple twenty dollar fee creates all of these files, and it's done through Vidyo.ai. Are you familiar with this mm -hmm. at all? Okay, okay, so you are familiar. Um, just way yeah, there's the also Reshare.io is another one. Reshare and yeah, and um, oh, there's one other one too. I can't remember the name of it now, but. Yeah, I just actually, guys. I just switched to an AI uh, podcast tool as well. Um, so we were using Descript for a while, which is also an AI tool, but we've actually switched our podcast editor. Now we use resound.fm. Uh, Heard of that. It's very similar to Audacity, but it automatically picks the parts that you need to edit. So you don't, you only have to look at the parts you need to edit. Wow. You and are, are you doing most of your thing? podcast through uh, River? Uh, Riverside or because it sounds uh, like we use StreamYard. Oh, StreamYard. Okay. We were using Squadcast and Descript, but I find that Descript's audio processing kind of makes your voice sound weird. You know, sometimes there's some like inflection problems with it, and maybe it's just my voice that it screws up, but hard to say. Man, I do like the editor in Descript though, like the text editor. Fascinating. Most of my team's going to listen to this. I want to get, we're going to definitely take some of these tidbits. So last question I have for you, your business. Um, tell us yes. a little bit about your company, man. You're very knowledgeable when it comes to AI. So I'm assuming you're helping out a lot of clients with it. Yeah, we work for, I would say our, our, our market niche is difficult to market business. So I read a hook digital marketing in the United States as well as Hook digital marketing Canada. And we help businesses who are having some kind of a marketing issue, 
maybe they're they've hit some kind of plateau and they can't push through it. Spending more money on ads is not making them any more money. Maybe they lost all their search engine traffic. You know, those kind of marketing problems. You just hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, I also write books for, this is my first kind of, I guess I would call consumer book is uh, Will AI Take My Job, which is on Amazon, of course. And I also write small business books. Um, I wrote How We've Always Done It, which is about how to fix problems in your business due to kind of process and apathy and, and other problems that people have when they've been running a business for a while. And I also wrote a book called Peertainment, which is about the peer-driven entertainment world and how you need to partner with AI, which is what gave me the idea for the AI book in the first place, and uh, how to partner with the platforms so that you can actually make money while you are promoting your business at the same time, rather than paying money to promote your business. Beautiful. That's excellent, man. So the company's website, I think you gave it to me, but just want to get it one last time at the end here. What's the website to, to get in touch with you and your company? Hookdm.com or hookdm.ca in Canada. I'm part of a mastermind called the DM family. And uh, oh, nice. and it's for deal maker. What's 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 DM stand Price for? Digital marketing. Digital marketing. That's great, man. Uh, I have to say, dude, this has been interesting, Matt, uh, you're obviously a wealth of knowledge when it comes to AI and technology. So it was an honor to talk to you. Thanks so much for being here. Um, guys get in touch with him. He obviously knows his stuff and uh, it's a passion. You can see it in his eyes. You can hear it in his voice and, uh, pick up his book. Will AI, I mean, wait, let me get the exact title. Will AI take my job? Predictions about AI and corporations, small business and the workplace. So Matt Rouse, it's been an honor. Thanks so much guys. And Remember, a million-dollar book will lead to a million-dollar life. Right on.